Good morning, everybody. Um, when I was talking to Robin uh, about coming to Versus and spending some time, we were thinking about what area we would cover. And obviously, in the traditional security world, the concept of perimeter is actually the boundary between the trusted and untrusted world. And obviously, as technologies evolved very rapidly, things have changed. Um, so uh, we came up with this title. We probably could have called this thing actually winning by losing. So I'm going to give three examples of major perimeter fails, and then I'm going to talk about what it means for our industry going forward. And you're welcome to call out what you think I'm about to say after I show you this clip. So let's start with the first one. Anybody want to call out what that might have meant? That's the direct, that is the death of your perimeter firewall and your perimeter technology, right? That's how many hackers think about it. I have to get, I have to find a very small area that I can exploit and I could go forward. Let's look at a second area of failure around perimeter. So Bilbo Baggins was actually the first APT. He made his way into Mordor, scurried around, hid from the other orcs, and actually destroyed the entire kingdom by doing it. Third perimeter failure. My favorite. There's a plane waiting for us to take us to Miami in an hour. They'll make a big thing about it. Very familiar scene with Don Corleone's son, Michael Corleone, taking a trusted asset and turning it into an untrusted asset, something that you actually thought you were trusted, allowing it to communicate to something that you weren't. So why is our perimeter dying? Well, the perimeter is dying for one very simple reason, is that the entire IT industry is going through a massive wave of innovation. And we have a condition now where the uh, concept of a perimeter and a data center actually doesn't matter. Why? because we are actually running our compute anywhere we want. We run it in our own computing environments. We run it in the cloud. We run it on bare metal. We run it on containers. Um, speed and agility, the entire raisin d'etre, right, the entire grilled cheese belt of restaurants within a square mile of this actual venue has something to do with how people are creating applications in the DevOps movement. And the third one is that we are seeing more distributed computing environments than we've ever expected in our life. Uh, my old employer, Cisco Systems, estimates there are about 300 million cloud servers in the marketplace. That's a lot of attack surface. So the traditional boundaries for building security for data center has actually gone, uh, gone away. And four conditions that actually are the most important innovations in our industry today, and also the race conditions that make our security fail. Blazingly fast uh, networks. Uh, pretty much the interconnection speed of anything is actually going to pretty much nil that we are going to be a world where everything's gigabit connected. On-demand computing. It is easy to take a credit card, we know this story, and go to Amazon and set up a web server and start building a business. Continuous application delivery. And what's even more amazing, the next wave of computing, um, think about containers, think about lambdas, are actually compute images that can live for microseconds. Very difficult conditions if you're building a security paradigm. So, what is, so where is our security industry now? So all of these great innovations are going on, many of them originating here in the Valley. And when I think about the security industry, um, I think about Rome. Can anybody, show of hand, does anybody know what I've actually just put up in front of you? You don't count, sir. What is it? Defense in depth. Defense in depth, right. Also known as uh, the layers of Rome. So if you go to Rome, you can see, a, um, you can see an obelisk that was from the pre-Roman era. You can see a, um, 
uh, an actual column that the Romans took from the Egyptians, and then you can see a crucifix on top. We have built layers and layers of technology to protect the data center over a course of 30 years. None of them are particularly well related to each other and all have to coexist. So we are in a situation that we are actually trying to decouple um, areas of history, and that's actually going to fail. So what does it mean for us? All of these layers of security, all of this investment, I think Ajay said earlier this morning, $65 billion spent in the United States. A show of hands, are we safer or less safe? Safer? Less safe. So spending more and putting more technology in place is making us less safe. What does that tell us? That tells us uh, effectively that we are repeating Einstein's definition of insanity, which is doing the same thing again and again and expecting a different outcome. So we have to go and look at this different, which is why I think this is important for Versus. Uh, let's start with a little bit of math. And there's going to be a lot. I saw some of the other presenters today. There's going to be a lot of math. Um, one of my customers, which I will leave unknown, has 7.5 million security roles in their enterprise. Think about that. They have had to write 7.5 million rules in their security devices to actually manage a large, globally distributed enterprise. Imagine if you just took the math and said 5% of them were probably done wrong in error. Somebody was texting, somebody was hip chatting, somebody called in sick, somebody just made a mistake and miskeyed. There's a potential for 375,000 errors. That begins to lay out the attack path, the attack surface for bad actors. So what we are doing is every day that we install more and more security technology into our data center, we are actually creating more and more errors and more and more ways for bad guys to get in. So what do you do about it? We're, in every other part of our society, talking about artificial intelligence. We are talking about machine learning. But we haven't talked about the most important and significant element of where the failure is in security, which is human middleware. Now, I have nothing against human beings. I'm married to one. I've actually co-created two of them. So I am a complete enabler of human middleware, all who spend a lot of time on their phones. But if you are going to build large, distributed, heterogeneous, hybrid, and dynamic computing, meaning everything that we're doing going forward, you are not going to be able to manage it with people. So the fundamental change that we're going to see is that the machines are going to have to manage our security. And that's going to require a form of intelligence and a form of synchronicity between the management of security and the actual things that we're trying to protect. Now imagine if you could flip this paradigm, and once again, we're at versus. Imagine if your compute assets could actually protect themselves. Now think about that, right? We think about our laptops, our mobile phones, our data center computing as assets to be protected, effectively saying they are the victims, we have to put security in place to protect them. What happens if they could protect themselves? What happens if they could understand what is trying to communicate with them and saying, should it be allowed to occur or shouldn't? Once if you could create an immune system. If we are going to build a computing paradigm for the 21st century, we're going to have to do it in a way that it can protect itself. Your body has white blood cells to stave off infection. Now, when you hit a super bug, you need a little bit of help. But by and large, day to day, you go through the world protecting yourself. Why can't your computing do that as well? Areas to start. The first one, you, we have to invert the paradigm. We have to stop thinking about devices and about computing centers as things to protect. We actually have to think about them as living um, entities that actually know, have to know how to protect themselves. Flip your paradigm. Look at what you're trying to protect and say, how does it protect itself? Secondly, um, there's a very interesting thing, and I've spent a large part of my career building the infrastructure for the internet, switches and routers. And if you know how DARPA created the internet, it was a very simple proposition. I can connect any 
point to another point over an IP network, right? And even in the case of a nuclear war, if it got blown up, I would still find a way, right? So networking is about can. Security, however, is about should. Should a device, should a, a uh, computing cell, should a server be allowed to connect to another one? Can you start with a paradigm that says, I'm going to reduce those communications to only the ones that are authorized? Once again, flipping the paradigm that we've built today. And the hardest one, and obviously the clearly the hardest one, is can we start to use automation? Can we start to use intelligence to automate our security operations and do that without human middleware? It's a very scary proposition. Imagine taking people out of the heart of your security operations. Now, who's going to sign up for that? I'll argue to this morning that if you do not build around these three principles, you're going to be very challenged going forward. Because if you can do that, if you can actually create an immune system, if you can create the DNA of a protected, privileged, and trusted environment, you can actually start to grow your footprint again. You can start to actually take advantage of all this innovation that is coming out um, in the world, right? Because we have more innovation right now than we've had in 25 years. And you can actually start to trust your computing again. Thank you.